I want justice. There's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. Osama bin Laden and 9-11 changed the world forever. Born into privilege, the charismatic Islamic extremist will die as the 21st century's face of evil. He became a religious fascist. You either agree with me or you don't, and I'm going to kill you if you don't. This is a story of a man whose anti-Western rhetoric turns him into an idol and motivator to militant Muslims around the world. He believed he was a kind of Islamic messiah that could take this struggle to other countries. But in the end, even his deep pockets and sinister creativity aren't enough to keep him as the leading voice of global jihad. Ten years. That's how long the U.S. has been hunting the man responsible for the worst terrorist attack in its history. And now, as a security satellite watches a tall man pacing around an enclosed garden, the CIA think they have him in their sights. So on May the 1st, 2011, in the pre-dawn hours of the morning, two fully loaded stealth Black Hawk helicopters approach the garden compound on a mission directly approved by the president. A team of elite U.S. Navy SEALs blast their way in. The long arm of American justice has come for the world's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. In 1957, Osama bin Laden is born to one of the richest families in Saudi Arabia the birthplace of Islam. Extremely wealthy family, considered pretty much up in the upper social echelons of Saudi Arabia. Osama means lion in Arabic, and he's the 17th of 54 children from his father Muhammad's 22 wives. Muhammad bin Laden is a self-made billionaire, earning his fortune in the construction business. He built a lot of the Saudi palaces, he built some roads, there are airports. He became the most powerful, most influential non-royal in Saudi Arabia, and they remain that today. The Bin Laden company is sort of the Bechtel of the Middle East. They call them the contractor to the king. Throughout his childhood, Osama involves himself in his father's work and receives training in explosives to blast out mountains for roadways. Knowledge he will one day put to use with devastating effect. He also gets something else from his father, his faith, which will dominate every aspect of his life. Osama bin Laden's father was a very, very devout Muslim. What he did was instill a very, very pious attitude, you know, that you read the Quran, you become very, very familiar with the Prophet, and that the model of the Prophet is the way to model your own life. He venerated the Prophet Muhammad, and also the, the global borderless side of Islam in terms of eventually the Islamic faith being the faith of the entire world. Critically, Bin Laden learns how the Prophet Muhammad wasn't just a religious figure, but also a great general who believed in spreading Islam through warfare. But at this stage, he's like any other young man growing up. According to his mother... He played football, went to picnics, rode horses and socialized. He never caused me to worry about him in his teenage years. He was described as a very intelligent, uh, very generous, very kind. By all accounts, was very well liked uh, by, by the people that knew him in Saudi Arabia as he was growing up. I think most who met him remarked on his soft-spokenness and his gentility in terms of dealing with other people. In 
In 1968, tragedy strikes the 10-year-old when his father dies in a plane crash. But Bin Laden inherits between 30 and 80 million dollars, which is held in trust until he's 21. He inherited a large sum of money from his father, but his faith continued to kind of uh, regulate and control his life. This fortune will enable Bin Laden to become one of the largest financial sponsors of Islamic extremist activities in the world. In 1978, at the age of 20, he enrolls as a student at the King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. He studies very Western subjects, economics, business administration, management, and his father's trade, civil engineering. But then events abroad start affecting him deeply. The Lanz University days came at a time when the Muslim world had been shocked by the defeat by the Israelis in the 67 war. Bin Laden turned his generation, the generation of defeat. And so that it was a time of looking for answers. How do we Muslims be able to stand up for themselves? This is when he comes across the works of the radical Palestinian professor, Abdullah Azam. Azam was a very, very chief member of the Islamic Muslim Brotherhood, and Azam essentially became bin Laden's mentor. A refugee from the Palestinian struggle against Israel, Azam believes religion and politics are completely intertwined. Azam was almost fanatical in his desire to see the elimination of the state of Israel through violent jihad. To Azam, most Palestinians are Muslims, and an attack on one Muslim is an attack on all. His motto is brutally uncompromising. The rifle alone, no negotiations, no conferences, and no dialogue. Bin Laden very much took that to heart and used it as the core of his appeal to the Muslim world. Implacable violent jihad or holy war will ultimately become the defining force in bin Laden's version of Islam. Though at this stage, he's just a young man with ideas. He has no cause. That is until another event abroad turns him from idealistic student into a warrior and terrorist. Soviet tanks roll into Afghanistan on Christmas Eve, 1979. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 is seminal because it's the first time that a Western power, the Soviet Union, invades a Muslim country and tries to overcome Islam. Bin Laden is particularly struck by how the Afghan people fight back, especially the Mujahideen the Islamic holy warriors. The Mujahideen are inspirational. Because then you have a group who, in fact, represent Islam and will fight the infidel and will fight for the future of Islam. The words of his mentor, Abdullah Azam, suddenly become real. An attack on Muslims is an attack on Islam. He has to go there. The 23-year-old Osama bin Laden arrives in Peshawar, Pakistan, just 30 miles from the Afghan border. Peshawar, which was more or less the headquarters of jihad in northern Afghanistan, was really a milieu of what we would call today radical Islamists from around the world. He sees a city teeming with Mujahideen, drawn from many different countries, 
to fight the holy war against the Russians. And he quickly realizes that he has little to offer as a fighter. He has no military training or battle experience. But he does have one thing. Money. Bin Laden started out financing the operation, providing money and weapons and equipment uh, to the Afghan fighters, the Mujahideen. He doesn't just use his own money to fund the Afghan resistance. He lobbies wealthy Saudis back home. Bin Laden was treated by the Saudi government as sort of the poster boy for the success of their educational system and their religious system. Because here is this billionaire son who could have lived in Monaco or in Switzerland, and here he is in Afghanistan. As a fundraiser, he's brilliant, bringing in $50 million a year for his Muslim brothers. But by 1984, he realizes that the Afghan resistance needs more than money. It needs organization. With thousands of Arab fighters from Egypt, Syria, and Jordan flooding into the city to support the Mujahideen, there's chaos. So bin Laden steps in to establish order. Osama bin Laden set up the Services Bureau in 1984, the Waktab al Kirimat. It assisted foreign fighters coming into Afghanistan, making sure they were housed and fed and taken to training camps or to Afghanistan. Using his business school discipline, bin Laden professionalizes the process. He tracks every recruit's movements, monitors and assesses their progress through training camps and their successes in battle. He personally finances this operation to the tune of $300,000 a year. He also uses the family's construction company to funnel in new recruits, build tunnels, and mountain hideaways to protect them from Soviet bombs. Bin Laden, he said, what we're really vulnerable to is Soviet and Afghan government air power. And we really need positions where we can protect our soldiers, protect our supplies, care for our, our wounded in, in protected areas. And bin Laden brought in construction equipment, tunnel digging equipment, dump trucks, bulldozers from his parents' company. He earned a reputation as the young man who rode the bulldozer in the midst of bullets. It was not exactly that he was a fighter, but he, he was a combat engineer, and apparently a very good one. Yet for all his skills as an organizer, and logistics man. It's not enough. He yearns to be a holy warrior and kill the enemies of Islam himself. These first steps are only the beginning to the unimaginable cruelty and terrorist operations he'll spearhead all over the world. In the summer of 1986, He's finally allowed to become a warrior in the center of the action. When it became time to get his hands dirty, he was one of the first people on the front lines. This is something that really ingratiated Osama bin Laden to his peers and helped to develop his legend. He finds war intoxicating. At last, he's battling for his faith against a godless enemy. Something terrifying is unleashed in the once shy and gentle young man. Bin Laden fought one particular horrific battle where the Mujahideen was almost defeated. In one encounter, as part of a patrol of just 50 Arabs, he fights off an assault from a far superior, trained and equipped Soviet force. These were very brutal battles. They're, they're, you're talking tank warfare, artillery, helicopter gunships. His armor was, by all accounts, a ferocious warrior. 
A senior Afghan commander at the time said, I watched him with his Kalashnikov in his hand, under fire from mortars, and the multi-barreled rocket launchers. At this stage, bin Laden is cutting an heroic figure on the battlefield. Before he arrived, his fighters would get sort of slowly go silent, almost as if they sensed his arrival. So there's a huge mystique built up very quickly around this man. His mystique grows thanks to how he lives his life. The son of extreme privilege asks no special favors, and it all adds to his charisma. He was very respected by the people he fought alongside because for a, the scion of a, of a billionaire, he slept with them and he, uh, he ate the food they ate. The Afghans became very devoted to him and very loyal to him because of his actions in support of their cause. By now, it isn't just Afghans who revere him. Arab journalists based in Peshawar publish reports of his battlefield heroics throughout the Middle East. This gives bin Laden a reputation and status in the militant Muslim world he's never experienced before, and a confidence to take his jihad to a whole new level. In 1986, Osama bin Laden is introduced to Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, a respected surgeon and leader of a militant Egyptian fundamentalist group. It's a relationship that marks a shift in bin Laden's focus from holy warrior to international terrorist. I think al-Zawahiri is a lucky find for Osama bin Laden in the sense that his organization had some very talented military people former military officers, Egyptian special forces officers, security people, policemen, uh, bomb makers, munitions handlers. We believe in our religion. Zawahiri's version of jihad is that there is only one correct form of Islam, theirs, and that anyone, even fellow Muslims who don't rise up to support them, are fair targets. If you didn't worship the right way, if you didn't pray the right way, if you didn't believe these things, you really were just another infidel, a Muslim perhaps, but, a, but an infidel. And he was willing to kill all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of people. Zawahiri also believes they should concentrate their fight on what he calls the near enemy. Those countries in the Arab world who lack his fanaticism. Though bin Laden is drawn to al-Zawahiri's extremism, in one respect, he wants to go even further. Jihad should be spread everywhere. Bin Laden said, you know, that's never going to work. We need to have a bigger impact in the world if we're going to do what we want to do, if the jihad is to be accomplished. That same year, bin Laden reveals what he means by everywhere. He delivers his first speech denouncing the United States. The Americans take our money and give them to the Jews so that they can kill our children with it in Palestine. In preparation for global jihad, bin Laden sets up an organization he calls the base. In Arabic, Al-Qaeda. There are four basic components to the Al-Qaeda organization at its inception. The first is to field fighters for training, advising, and combat. The second is administrative. The third deals with religious matters, issuing fatwas and developing courses for members. The fourth is a media propaganda wing. Later, bin Laden will add its own military faction. They have a righteous mission, and the mission is, in fact, to uh, destroy Western influence, but also to defend Islam, uh, which is very important, that they are, in fact, uh, the soldiers of the right. They are righteous, and, th and this belief is very, very strong. From the time 
Bin Laden organized Al-Qaeda. He viewed it as an enduring organization that would move on from after Afghanistan to uh, help Muslims who were defending Islam in other areas of the world. He saw it as the vanguard of a bigger movement, of a bigger jihad. He was outspoken, if you will, in his saying that we are just a small group of people. Our job is to inspire, instigate other Muslims to join the jihad. And I think that message was a very powerful one. Bin Laden's global vision was what drove the whole thing, and of course his financing. He was the first Islamic jihadist that had the finances, uh, and not just the finances, but the leadership capability to actually pull this off. He now does something extraordinary. He demands that all its members swear a religious oath to him personally. In one step, he goes from being one among many holy warriors into a cult-like figure in whose name his servants will terrorize the world. It changed everything. Now he believed he was a kind of Islamic messiah that could take this struggle to other countries. In 1989, Russia's war in Afghanistan finally comes to an end. The Soviets are humiliated and withdraw. The defeat of the Soviet Union and their push out of Afghanistan was a huge moment uh, for bin Laden. Claiming credit for the Afghan victory, the Al-Qaeda leader speaks of two vital lessons their victory teaches. He realized that you can achieve a great deal in terms of imposing enormous amounts of violence on your enemy, even though they must, may be much better armed than you. Secondly, he believes victory is proof that God is on his side. Bin Laden thought it was essential to, to make this a victory, granted, of course, by Allah, but a victory for the entire Islamic world and not just for the Afghans. It showed that Arabs could stand up on the battlefield and defeat a superpower. From 1989 onwards, Osama bin Laden no longer wastes any time wondering whether his enemies can be beaten. It's how they can be beaten. Having brought down one superpower, he now focuses on the other. What he sees as the biggest evil, the United States. A year after the Soviet forces are routed, the brutal Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein moves 100,000 soldiers onto the Kuwaiti and Saudi borders, ready to invade. Bin Laden returns to his home country, Saudi Arabia, and immediately sends a message to the Saudi royal family, offering to form an army of 30,000 Afghan veterans to defeat Saddam, an offer that is rejected. One of the most significant events in bin Laden's life, which eventually led to 9-11, was the Saudi government rebuffed his request and told him, no, thank you. We don't need you. Uh, we've got the United States. We're bringing the United States into Saudi Arabia. The prophet is reputed to have said on his deathbed that, I, that if I live, there will be no other religion on the Arab Peninsula but Islam. And I think bin Laden was extraordinarily offended by the Saudis' decision to invite Christians to defend them. Bin Laden watches as 300,000 male and female US soldiers arrive in his country. They set about building bases, drinking alcohol, and sunbathing. Wave after wave, as American troops came into Saudi Arabia and established bases, was abomination upon abomination for Osama bin Laden. And the Saudi royal family was welcoming it all. In his eyes, 
the infidel U.S. cannot be the salvation of Saudi Arabia. The American government has made the greatest mistake in entering the peninsula that no religion from the non-Muslim states has entered for 14 centuries. It literally changed him, and in his mind, he would not stop until he saw the United States destroyed. When bin Laden asks fellow Muslims to rise up against this outrage, the Saudi regime grows uneasy, raids his home, and places him under house arrest. They wanted him banished. They took away his citizenship, cut off the $7 million stipend his family was getting, and literally just disconnected him from Saudi Arabia, considering him now a threat directly to the royal family. With the Saudi government threatening to imprison him, he flees to Sudan, where there's an Islamic government. In the early 1990s, the radical National Islamic Front are in power, and Sudan has a reputation as a safe haven for terrorist organizations. It is also a bankrupt country that needs money. Bin Laden is invited in and becomes known as a walking bank. He had to build roads, major motorways, various engineering projects. He employed a lot of local people, and he was very much welcomed in uh, Sudan uh, for a long time. All this is simply cover for bin Laden's real operations. He sets up a new headquarters for Al-Qaeda in a rich suburb of Khartoum in 1992 and establishes a series of investment, transportation, agricultural, and construction companies. All are designed and operated to secure explosives, weapons, and chemicals for his terrorist organization. There were stories about, whilst developing the wealth of Sudan, a plane went from Sudan carrying sugar and came back absolutely jam-packed full of rifles, explosives, rocket-propelled grenades from Afghanistan. Bin Laden seems to have disappeared off the radar. Then in 1993, he announces himself to the Western world. Over 1,000 are injured when a bomb explodes under New York's World Trade Center. Six are dead. Although the direct connection with Al-Qaeda was never established, most scholars believe it was in the shadows, but it was there. The CIA certainly take bin Laden extremely seriously and set up a special unit to focus on him. It's called the Osama bin Laden unit and is led by Mike Scheuer. It's clear that they are dealing with a terrorist the likes of which they have never seen before. We had, uh, in 1996, a uh, Sudanese walk into one of our embassies in East Africa. And it turns out that the gentleman was a bodyguard of Osama bin Laden uh, while he was living in the Sudan. What he described was an organization unlike any we had seen. And it was involved not just in bombing and fighting, but it was involved in trying to to procure or build weapons of mass destruction. In May 1996, bin Laden leaves Sudan for Afghanistan, where he's welcomed with open arms by the militant Islamic Taliban regime. I think when you see how bin Laden was welcomed back into Afghanistan, you can see that the Afghans perceive themselves under debt to him. Not only monetary debt, but also under personal debt for the risks he took with his own life uh, during their war against the communists. Al-Qaeda's reputation now grows to a whole new level. His stance against American values and the feebleness of the Saudi regime makes him a hero to radical Muslims and people who believe they are the underdogs all over the world. Drawn by the chance to fight back against American imperialism, thousands of Muslims from Kashmir, Pakistan, 
India, and the Soviet republics come flooding to his cause. And he trains his new recruits in bomb making and terrorist tactics. All the while, he ramps up his anti-American rhetoric. In February 1998, he says, To kill Americans and their allies, both civil and military, is an individual duty of every Muslim who is able, until their armies, shattered and broken-winged, depart from all the lands of Islam, incapable of threatening any Muslim. He adds a new dimension to his skills as a military organizer, a truly evil terrorist imagination. One of the dramatic changes in his operational techniques was when he changed and began using suicide bombers in his attacks. What that created for the first time in history was an army of essentially smart bombs. These were bombs with human brains. That could, they could think, they could navigate, and commit acts of terror that up till that time could never be committed in such a, an operational fashion. On August the 7th, 1998, a truck is driven into the US Embassy in Kenya. The suicide bomber kills 213 people, including 12 Americans and wounding 4,600. Most of the victims are Kenyan civilians. He had made a transition uh, from a Saudi socialite, a wealthy person, into this horrible mass murderer that could care less about the death of innocent people. Four minutes later, a second suicide bomb at the US Embassy in Tanzania explodes. 11 are killed, 84 injured. This is the first time bin Laden does what will become his signature, the multiple attack. They became more and more ruthless and specifically focusing on American interests and American uh, people and calling for Muslims to start killing them. These acts of terrorist violence are abhorrent. They are inhuman. We will use all the means at our disposal. In retaliation, President Clinton fires 75 cruise missiles at Al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan. Other missiles demolish a factory in Sudan. But these attacks only anger the Muslim world and feed bin Laden's image as an Islamic hero. He goads America further. I am not afraid of the American threats against me. As long as I am alive, there will be no rest for the enemies of Islam. I will continue my mission against them. It's a cold-blooded promise. Next, he targets the US military. A small boat manned by suicide bombers rips a massive hole in the billion dollar American destroyer, the USS Cole, in the port of Aden. Killing 17 American sailors, 39 others are injured. But for all his success, bin Laden's terrorism isn't achieving his goal. His aim is to lure the US to attack him inside Afghanistan, where they have no allies, and where they can be picked off from the hills by guerrillas. Just like what happened with the Soviets in the 80s. His inspiration is Vietnam. They looked at the example of Vietnam. Americans had half a million troops in Vietnam, but they ended up by being defeated. So therefore, this great Satan in the West, which appears to be a very, very powerful military power, can be defeated. For that tactic to work, he needs to find a way to make sure the Americans come after him. He really thought they needed a big attack 
Uh, and he, he was always a man who liked big things uh, in terms of actions. Osama bin Laden will devise a plan so evil it will change the world forever and force America to give him the attention he craves. The vision which they had for 9-11 was to deliver such a blow to the United States. It will so antagonize the Americans that they will overreact. So the head of Al-Qaeda dusts off an old idea that has been floating around since 1995. Bin Laden was aware of what's called the Bojanka plot, which was a plot to use airlines coming from foreign countries into the United States and, and uh, explode those planes. The original plan involves hijacking and flying 10 planes piloted by suicide operatives into 10 targets on America's east and west coasts. It fits in with his favored MO of hitting multiple targets at the same time. Bin Laden decides to streamline the idea. He will use fewer planes, but strike at the very heart of American values. Their businesses, military systems, and centers of political power. In Bin Laden's mind, the World Trade Center towers were the representation of what America was. In his mind, heathenistic, materialistic, immoral, greedy, exporting that greed and that money all around the world. It doesn't matter to him that these are civilian targets, including some Muslims. It was okay to attack symbolic targets, even if they included innocent civilians, because that was Allah's will. If they were good Muslims, they, they would go to heaven. If they, they weren't, they would not. And his developing ideology, that was just fine. The 21st century's most vicious terrorist now brings together all his knowledge and everything that has ever motivated him. His business studies and organizational skills, his ability to raise vast sums of money and to mobilize recruits from anywhere in the world, his knowledge of covert operations, and how to obtain weapons. His expertise in explosives learned from his father and his knowledge of civil engineering and how buildings are constructed. So for bin Laden to, to begin to plan an attack against a building and his understanding of actually hitting a building fit right into his construction background. Bin Laden will later recall their expectations when the first plane hits the World Trade Center tower. But for all his expertise, he vastly underestimates the effectiveness of the impact. We calculated and advanced the number of casualties from the enemy who would be killed on the position of the tower. We calculated that the floors that would be hit would be three or four floors. Due to my experience in this field, I was thinking that the fire from all the fuel in the plane would hit all the floors above it only. This is all we hoped for. In the autumn of 1999, bin Laden personally chooses the four main suicide operatives for what he calls the planes operation. The lead hijacker, Egyptian-born Mohammed Atta, is an aspiring jihadist living in Germany. He's selected for his anti-American fervor, his fluency in English, and his familiarity with life in the West. The other three are all long-term Al-Qaeda veterans who swear loyalty to bin Laden a year earlier. In all, 19 operatives will carry out the suicide attacks. Osama bin Laden would say they were doing something which would in fact mean that they would be martyrs and heroes, which would help Islam and would help the whole Muslim world. To make sure the operation bears his signature, he explains that all the planes hijacked in the United States must be crashed or exploded at nearly the same time to maximize the psychological impact.
On the morning of September the 11th, 2001, Osama bin Laden invites guests round to listen to the news on his radio. Immediately we heard the news that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. The brothers were overjoyed. He tells his guests, be patient, more is to come. Osama bin Laden had learnt that one of the rules of war is surprise. Your greatest ally is surprise. And he achieved that. The operation succeeds beyond his wildest dreams. Now everyone around the world knows his name. It was a live, televised, almost Hollywood-esque terrorist event. And this constituted the most successful terrorist attack uh, of all time. In the days following the 9-11 attacks, Throughout the Middle East, young men in cafes would watch the event being played over and over on television and weep with joy and admiration over what bin Laden had achieved. A total of 2,977 people are killed in New York City, Washington DC and Pennsylvania. It was just a scene of utter horror. The shock on people's faces, the funerals, the endless funerals of firemen and civilians having been killed in, in the collapse of the two towers was, was really, really tragic. Photographers weeping as, as they witnessed it. I think America was deep in shock. This had never happened to them before. Following the attacks, bin Laden pronounces, America has been hit by Allah at its most vulnerable point, destroying, thank God, its most prestigious buildings. Six days after the 9-11 attacks, the US President George W. Bush declares, I want him held, I want, I want justice. And, uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. Osama bin Laden becomes America's most wanted, with a $25 million reward on his head. The hunt for the world's most evil terrorist is on. Just as bin Laden has wanted all along, America at last invades Afghanistan. And the Americans launched their war on terror, which means that they would go anywhere in the world and use military force to eliminate anything they regard as Al-Qaeda or a terrorist group. US planes carry out heavy bombing raids on Al-Qaeda positions. And elite Delta Force commandos search for bin Laden deep inside the Tora Bora caves. But he eludes capture, fleeing to Pakistan. Bin Laden disappeared from the world scene. The CIA and virtually every other allied intelligence service in the world was trying to find out where he was. As the head of Al-Qaeda hides from his American hunters, he releases video and audio tape messages which reach audiences of millions and inspire terrorist attacks around the world. Bin Laden and his personality had now replicated itself in some of the 80 odd groups that were now carrying out attacks as if they were Al Qaeda. But if the aim of 9 11 was to spark a massive Islamic uprising, it fails. Horrific as these attacks are, the West remains stable. Instead, 
Bin Laden is forced to hole up in a secret compound enclosure in Abbottabad, at the foothills of the Himalayas, in Pakistan. At first, he fears the possibility of being seen during his daily walks in the garden. He knew he was being hunted from the skies. He knew that you know, just one sighting by a drone of a six foot three figure would lead to his annihilation. To evade American eyes, he follows exceptional security procedures. He uses no electronic devices and communicates only via a trusted courier. But as the years of seclusion grow, there are consequences. He becomes irrelevant. Forced isolation means that he can no longer be the leader of extreme Islam. Bin Laden was no longer the active commander that he used to be. He was the most wanted man on earth, couldn't go anywhere. He was wasting away, trapped inside his own prison. I protest to God so much about my isolation and being alone, I worry people will tire of me and will become old and worn out to them. But I protest only to God. Over time, Bin Laden becomes a shell of his former self, and his days are endlessly mundane. Most of the accounts that we received indicated that he simply sat inside most of the day, watching videos of his old speeches over and over and over. In 2010, as he continues his walks alone around his garden, he has no idea that an NSA satellite is watching. It has spotted a mysterious tall man constantly walking in circles. The CIA are notified. The agents give the mysterious man the nickname The Pacer, and they plan to get him. In the small hours of the morning on May the 1st, 2011, the world's most wanted terrorist is awoken by the sound of an explosion. He turns to his wife and says, Don't turn on the light. It is the last words he will ever say. <laughs> Navy SEALs burst into the compound. They find the Al-Qaeda leader in an upstairs bedroom with a pistol and an assault rifle nearby. I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda. Over the next 24 hours, bin Laden is buried in a religious funeral at sea, so his body can never become a shrine. But even so, Islamic terrorism hasn't gone away. As one fanatical leader dies, another movement is born. Right now, as you can see by simply looking around, the fire is spread everywhere. It's the responsibility of Osama bin Laden, but he's no longer necessary for it. By convincing impressionable young men that he alone followed the correct form of Islam, that he had a God-given right to determine who should live and die, and that anyone who opposed him was inferior and should be condemned, bin Laden applied much the same psychological tricks as Hitler. They allowed him to create a culture which justifies terrorism and brutality. But by his own terms, Osama bin Laden is a failure. There has been no Islamic uprising against the West, and the Arab world remains in absolute turmoil.